uh, you can turn in your Bibles to uh, Acts, Acts chapter 11. <laughs> chapter last week. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and turn this off because it'll beep. Uh, honestly, when I started looking at this chapter a few weeks ago, I thought these end verses that we're going to uh, consider this morning, I might just skip over them. You know, I thought, well, I mean, obviously they're there for a reason, but they're not that important, but well, the Lord showed me otherwise. <laughs> the more you get to studying it, the more you realize... That's why you put it there, amen? And so um, I, I'm enjoying going to the book of Acts. Uh, you know, of course, I enjoy studying the spiritual gifts. Uh, some preachers, they say, this is my favorite part of the Bible, favorite book of the Bible. Well, my favorite book of the Bible is whatever the one I'm preaching. Because <laughs> I enjoy preaching, amen? And uh, I enjoy the spiritual gifts, but uh, I'm enjoying going to the book of Acts. Never done this before. Uh, you know, done it in class as far as preaching through it. But uh, it's, it's been a blessing. I hope it's a blessing to each of you. Uh, Acts 11, and let's begin reading uh, in verse 26. Uh, well, let's see, verse 27. It says, And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem and Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And again, uh, you might be like I did when I initially reading and thought, oh, well, that, that's good. You know, that's um, uh, interesting that there was a prophecy there uh, you know, in the early church, and then, and then we see it took place. Luke records that for us as the, the writer here. And... Um, then they sent this offering to Jerusalem, and that, well, that's good. That's just recorded, and on we go to the next events, you know, the next big events. But as I said, the Spirit always records things for a reason. And as I began looking at this, and especially after last week, considering uh, you know, the preceding verses, I saw how these tied together so, so much and so well. And let's go back and read uh, what happened, because it says in these days. So what days is that talking about, verse 27? Well, let's go back. Uh, verse 22, it says, Then times of these things, well, I guess we need to go back. Let's go to verse 19, all right? Go all the way back. Uh, if you weren't here last week, we'll get the full story, all right? It says, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. Some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came into the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the church. <coughs> then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So that is the background as to what's happening. Uh, and then this prophecy, well, first of all, these um, believers come up from Jerusalem to Antioch, uh, following kind of after Barnabas. And one of them who comes up has a, a prophecy. Now, this is not prophecy like we see in Romans 12, all right? This is the one of the sign gifts of the early church uh, before the, the scriptures were complete, verifying the message of the gospel. And that's exactly how God, you know, God was using the uh, signs and wonders to the with the Jews. And here, one of those Jewish believers has a prophecy that there's going to be a famine. And, and Luke even records it for us under inspiration that it did happen. Uh, and that, you know, this prophecy came true. So we know it's validated. Uh, and so when that happened then, these disciples uh, there in Antioch decided to send a gift to the believers in Jerusalem. 
And then it says they did that by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. They send it back. And why is all that significant? Well, that's what we want to get into, all right? But it became, it came as a result of them being saved uh, through the preaching of these who uh, had initially preached uh, to them in Antioch. They had come, traveled as a result of the persecution in verse 19. They went to Antioch preaching, and remember last week I showed the map, all right? I'm not going to do that every week, all right? But the, uh, about 300 miles, uh, 400 some kilometers north of Jerusalem is Antioch, third largest city in the Roman Empire. And they were preaching, some were preaching just to the Jews, and they were just kind of talking about things. But then there were others who came after them and actually preached and exhorted. They, they were challenging them. They were proclaiming the message of the gospel. And they didn't preach just to the Jews. They preached to the Grecians. And many Gentiles began to get saved. And so then the church sends from Jerusalem, sends Barnabas to Antioch and says, we need you to validate. We want to make sure this is real what's happening. Make sure this isn't just some, you know, uh, fluke thing that really Gentiles are really getting saved. And when Barnabas gets there, he sees the hand of the Lord upon it. Uh, he says, in verse 24, he sees the grace of God and he exhorted them all with purpose of heart that would cleave unto the Lord. And so he, he encouraged them. That's what Barnabas is. One of his spiritual gifts, he's an encourager. And he encouraged them then to grow in their faith. And so that is the backdrop then for what we see taking place in the end of the chapter. So what do we, what do we learn from this? Well, I believe there's four things we can see. And what God would have for us to learn from their example is that we must purpose to demonstrate our faith through our actions and carry out what God gives us to do. You know, Barnabas encourages these believers there in Antioch to demonstrate their faith. And then, a year or so later, there's an opportunity to show their love and to demonstrate their faith. And they fully embrace it and do it. You know, that, that's, that's a sign of a true believer. When God gives us opportunity to, to act out and, and demonstrate our faith, we need to take advantage of it and do it. Amen. Uh, here was the opportunity. It wasn't something that, um, you know, uh, that it was compulsory. They didn't have to do this, but they saw a need, and they could meet the need, and they did. And God used the believers in Antioch to be a blessing to the church of Jerusalem. And uh, what an what a example they are. Let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get right into the, the text here, all right? Lord, we thank you for this morning, and I thank you, Lord, for uh, the Word of God. I thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to hear the Word of God, and, and Lord, to share the Word of God. I pray that now you would, uh, Lord, guide my words and thoughts, and that, Lord, most of all, your Spirit would take the Word of God and make application to our hearts. That, Lord, um, we would not be negligent, Lord, in, in demonstrating our faith, but, Lord, uh, every opportunity you give us, help us, Lord, be active in our witness. And, Lord, sharing what you've done with, uh, Lord, for us and, Lord, uh, what you want to do through us well, over the lost world. I pray that, Lord, you would guide and, Lord, work in each heart. And, Lord, help us to respond and, Lord, take uh, action accordingly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here we see, first of all, the direction for their faith. And this is kind of a review of last week, all right? But verse 23, we see what, what Barnabas told them to do. He said, uh, with purpose of heart. Uh, purpose, it suggests a setting forth. And we talked about how that same word is used of the showbread there in, in the, the temple uh, and the tabernacle, how that it was put on display. And Barnabas was and it basically saying to those Gentile believers in Antioch, you need to put your faith on display. Do this on purpose. Let the world see that you are a believer in Christ. You know, the church of Jerusalem, <laughs> they'd already admitted that they didn't quite believe it. They had doubt that these Gentiles were really getting saved. And that's why they sent Barnabas. They said, you need to go check this out, Barnabas. And remember, Barnabas was of Cyrene. He was, you know, he probably knew some of the guys that had left Jerusalem from the persecution and was up preaching in Antioch. They said, Barnabas, you know some of those guys. You know what this, you, you know how they really are. You go see what's going on. They'll, they'll, they'll trust you, and we, we trust you. You'll be kind of the middle man, and you go check this out. Is this really just a, is this real revival, or is this just kind of a fly-by-night thing? Or is this kind of, a, you know, emotional thing? Uh, is this legit? And so Barnabas arrives, and sure enough, it is legit. And he says, look, the saints in Jerusalem don't believe you're real. You need to just demonstrate that you're real with purpose of heart. And then not only have purpose, but to cleave unto the Lord. And the word cleave there, it means to abide, to persevere. He says you need to keep on. Don't just let this be a, a you know, a, <clears throat> a fickle decision. 
Don't just say you're going to you know, follow the Lord. Don't just say you've believed in, in Christ and, and in resurrection and then you let it, you go off and you go to the other feasts and the other tabernacles and you practice all the immorality of all the other false gods. He said you need to make this real. And you continue in your faith. You continue on. You let it be real. You cleave to the Lord. You purpose in your heart and you're going to make this thing real. And you let God change your life. Well, he gives them direction for their faith. Now, he did, yeah, it's one thing. If Barnabas just showed up and he held a weak revival and he said, you need to get right with God, you need to stay right with God. And then he went back to Jerusalem and said, well, I told them all off. That's not what he did. It says he stayed there a whole year. <laughs> he stayed there and he helped them. He discipled them. Amen. And that's whatever the whole message there. That's what we need to be doing. And then we can't just, we can't just bring people to the Lord and then expect them to, you know, you don't just leave a baby at the doorstep. Amen. Hey, when we get when we get a baby to the to the church house, we need to nurture them. Amen. We need to see them grow and develop a, a baby in Christ. And then we've got a disciple, and that's what Barnabas did. And he got help. He got Saul to come and help with him. Amen. And so here's Barnabas and Saul, and they're helping these believers, these early believers. And we talked about how last week uh, it says there in verse 26 that they were called Christians first in Antioch. And it wasn't it wasn't a term of endearment. It was a term of dis being to be despised oh you're one of those Christians oh you believe that Jesus you believe that Jewish teacher was God he actually rose from the dead you believe all those magic tricks he did down in Palestine yeah you're one of those Christians it was a mockery it was a shame to be called a Christian and yet that's what they took and they embraced it and they said yes I fully embrace I'm a believer in Christ I am a Christian I believe in the Christ and I'll follow after him and so that went on for a year, it says. So now we come to verse 27. In those days came prophets from Jerusalem and the Antioch. So now more of them come up, all right? They realize this thing's real. This is legit, and we want to be a part of it. As they come up, this one called Abbas, he came and signified by the Spirit there should be a great dearth by all the world. The dearth means it's a famine, a famine. And so here is this. Famine, I've already talked about how that was a, you know, a sign gift, and then it was verified, all right? Uh, Luke gives us exactly what it happened. By the way, secular history records this as well. It did happen, all right? Even secular historians validate that there was a worldwide famine, a worldwide shortage of food in the days of Claudius Caesar, so this really did happen. Uh, but then verse 29 is what I want to get to. It says, Then the disciples, every man, according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. The second thing we see, not only their direction for their faith, but then we see the determination of their faith. When it says here that they determined, it means to mark out or a bound, to make, to make a boundary, to a point or decree. They made a boundary. You know, what, what it basically saying is they set out a goal. They said, this, this preacher will say, this prophet from Jerusalem has said there's going to be a famine. And now it's come. And those saints in Jerusalem have already been attacked by the non-believing Jews down there. And they're already suffering all kinds of you know, horrible things. And now there's this famine going on. We want to be a blessing. Maybe we could send X number of dollars. Maybe we could send X pounds of food. Maybe we could send so many truckloads. Or whatever, you know, whatever it might be. So many pounds of barley or wheat or whatever you know. and we, we're going to set out a goal to help the believers in Jerusalem you know sometimes we get we get a little shy of setting a goal you know the old saying and I, I probably I know I've said it before if you aim at nothing you hit it every time <laughs> yeah. yeah well that's true <laughs> these believers they said we're we're going to trust God to do something that we can't do it. This is a worldwide famine. This is not a Jerusalem famine. So these believers, it's not like they've got, they've got it made up in Antioch and the, saints, the poor saints in Jerusalem are the ones suffering. They're all suffering. But they said, we want to be a blessing anyway. And they determined in their hearts, we're going to help the church in Jerusalem. The church that doesn't believe we're real. Wait a minute. The church that doesn't believe you're real. You mean the church that even doubted you were, they thought you were all fakes? Yeah, even them. We want to help them. Well, that's real faith. That's real compassion. They want to demonstrate their faith. And they set a goal. They said, we're going to determine to be a blessing. 
Uh, <clears throat> notice how they did this. It says, every man, every believer was a part of this giving. I want you to turn over to 2 Corinthians 9. And, and you can hold your place there because we're going to turn back and forth a little bit, all right? Because 2 Corinthians 9 gives us another example of Gentile believers doing the same thing uh, <laughs> later uh, to a, uh, a different group of believers, but doing the same thing, all right? Uh, and Paul, here in 2 Corinthians, writes in detail about that event. But here, <clears throat> verse, uh, 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7 it says, every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Mm -hmm. Here, it's, it's showing that every one of us are responsible to give. Mm -hmm. Now, this is, this is not the tithe offering. Uh, this is not the tithe. All right, this is an offering. And here in Acts 11, this is not the tithe. This is above the tithe. The tithe is commanded. And I think we all are pretty familiar with this. Uh, you, you hear uh, Pastor Mason a few years ago. You heard preaching on the tithing, amen? And the tithe. Uh, even Pastor Vernon touched on that when he was here last year. And uh, what was it last year? I get my years mixed up. Anyway, all right. Uh, the tithe is commanded all the way back from Abraham before the law. Uh, it's just a, a principle for all mankind that God uh, requires 10%. That we give it back to him. So this is not... Uh, the tithe, this is an offering in addition to the tithe. And this is a, a voluntary offering, and yet it is something that every one of them purposed to do. And when every person determines that they can do something, then it all gets accomplished. You know, uh, it's not equal giving, but equal sacrifice. It's not equal amount, but equal sacrifice. Uh, giving is not a spiritual gift. Now, you say, Pastor, wait a minute. You just preached on, like two weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, you preached on giving and the, the gift of giving and how that, yeah, that's a spiritual gift. No, no. The spiritual gift of giving enables someone to give a specific way. It's how they give. In fact, it's a very, it's a, the word related there in Acts, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, that he giveth a cheerful giver. A, God giveth a cheerful giver. And God, God enables some to give in a, a special way. We're all to give, all right? Uh, you know, it, it's not that some just had the money, you know, so they can give more. No, that's, that's not it, okay? Remember, these saints here at Antioch, they were experiencing a famine too. They were having a heart too. And yet they purposed. They said, we're going to be a blessing. And we're going to help those saints in Jerusalem. Every man, according to his ability. It says here, again, every man and according to his ability. Uh, the word ability is, is interesting. <clears throat> it means to be good for passing through. To have, uh, I can't say this word. I, was gonna, I forgot I was going to look this up in the dictionary and have it say it for me. Per Perconary means, I probably didn't say it right. But it means to be good for passing through. In other words, these believers recognized I'm simply a channel. What God has gifted me with, whether it be time, money, whether it be my possessions, it's just simply, it's not mine. It's God's, and he's put it in my hands to be passed on and used for his glory when someone else needs it. You know, I can, I, I can think of several people that, not just money, but even possessions. I think of a, a, a good friend in the States who years and years ago was in Bible college and his car, whew, he had an old, old car. And um, it was a, now this was in the 90s and he, it was a 76 model. All right, so there you go. That's how old it was. And the thing was a boat. I mean, it was, you know, yeah. um, <clears throat> I don't think y'all would have, well, you, some, you don't have Chrysler, don't have Chrysler down here anymore. Um, but uh, Chrysler Cordoba is what it was. I mean, it's as big as a boat, you know. And, um, and no, no joke, it, it was bigger than your boat. Right? <laughs> it was bigger than Brian's rubber ducky, all right? And uh, <clears throat> so the, the huge gas goes around. It had a 400 horsepower motor in it, a big old V8, and, and um, four barrel carburetor, you know. That thing sounded awesome, you know. And uh, finally, the reverse goes out in this car. 
And this, this poor guy, he doesn't have the money to fix the, the transmission and, uh, you know, find a parts is probably going to be <laughs> And he drives that car with no, without a reverse for a couple months. I remember he would park at church and he'd make sure that he took up two spots and no one parked, you know, parked in front of him and parked behind him. That way he just drive through, you know, because he couldn't back out. <laughs> He'd be stuck, you know. And uh, finally, you know what? There was a there was a deacon there at the church in Cal at Calvary. Gave that brother his car. He said, you know, I don't need this car. And it wasn't that the car was just worn out and beat up. No, in fact, it had my stereo in it actually. And he said, you know what, brother? I know you need that car more than I do. And he just gave him the car. He said, it's not mine, it's God's. And God told me you need it more than I do. Yeah, and, and I, I know of other people like that. Hey, you know what? We need to recognize what's our ability. It's not simply well, how much we, we put in the offering bag or you know, every week or how much we, we pledge. It's everything we have is God's. Amen. God wants us. Not just our wallet. Not just our bank account. He wants us. You know, that television we have. That, you know, that computer we have, that boat we have, that whatever, that house we have, it's all God's. Mm -hmm. And whenever God says, hey, so-and-so needs that, we need to say, okay, Lord, sure, I'll be the blessing. I can meet that need. Mm -hmm. That's how these believers responded. They said, we don't have much. We're, we're, ha we're in the midst of a famine ourselves. But according to our ability, whatever God puts in our hands, we're willing to give back and share it with the brothers in Jerusalem and be that blessing. That's how they uh, were directed in the direction of their faith. Every man according to his ability. And I notice here that, that that's uh, <clears throat> the thrust of the message, right? That these last two points are going to come quick, all right? Notice in uh, verse <clears throat> 29, it says, They sent the relief of their brother which dwelt in Judea. In verse 30, which also they did. You know, it's one thing. In fact, we could go back. Go back to 2 Corinthians. But let's go back over 2 Corinthians again. And look at chapter 8. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 10. Again, this is Paul writing about the believers of Macedonia. And they gave an offering, all right, to the church of Jerusalem years later. But when Paul wrote to the church of Corinth... Uh, he had to encourage them to give. Notice in verse 10, uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 10, he says, Herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you, who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also of that which ye have. For if there first be a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. Mm. Here, what Paul was saying in the first part of uh, chapter 8 there, 2 Corinthians 8, he gives the example of the believers of Macedonia, how they gave beyond their ability, and they were, they were poor. I mean, they, they didn't have, they were poor as Job's turtle, you know, uh, <laughs> as we'd say in the South. And yet, they trusted God, they gave themselves, and then they gave out of their own, uh, beyond their ability. And now Paul, he says in verse 10 there, he says, look, I was with you a year ago, and you made a commitment. You said, Church of Corinth, we want to help the Church of Jerusalem, just like the saints of Macedonia are. And he says, it's been a whole year, and you've not said anything. Mm -hmm. Now, you were forward even. You were saying, yes, we want to step in and be a blessing. We want to help. But you've not done it. You've not followed through on what you promised. And you need to be faithful. What you said you're going to do, you need to do it. Mm. Yeah, Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes, it's better to vow, not to vow a vow, but to vow a vow, not keep it. Mm. That principle is true throughout the scriptures. So, and here, that's what Paul said. Look, you, you said you're going to send this amount, or you know, whatever it was, you're going to send an offering to the church of Jerusalem. You didn't just tell me that. You told God that. Because God heard you say that. You made a commitment, and you haven't done it. And he said, look, where there was a willing, now there needs to be the performance of it also. You need to do it. Well, you know what? That wasn't the case in Antioch. Back here in Acts 11, it says they, they determined to do it. In verse 30, they did it. Amen. Hey, you know what? When God puts something in our hearts to do it, when God puts something in our heart, whether it's to, to serve in church, whether it's maybe to give somebody something, 
you know, with us to, to help out in an area. Hey, and we, we don't need to ignore that. Mm. We, we need to respond. Maybe it's that spiritual gift. Maybe it's that one thing. And you just say, Lord, I just don't know if I can do that. Hey, if God has told you that what he wants you to do, just do it. Amen? Just do it. Do the performing of it. These believers in Antioch, they said, God's led our heart, and we purpose in our heart. We can, do, we can be a blessing. We can be a help. And we did it. Amen? Uh, <clears throat> Philippians 1 and verse 6, it says, yep. I wasn't going to turn there. Let's turn there. <laughs> Philippians 1 and verse 6. says, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And later Paul wrote in Philippians 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. You know, if God has laid on your heart to do something, he's going to enable you to do it. I think I said it a few weeks ago. Uh, God will give more through you than he'll ever give to you. If God's laid on your heart, uh, you know, just a few weeks ago we talked about missions in our AGM. And uh, we want to, we're, we're doing a lot for missions. And I praise the Lord for that. That, is just, that was tremendous to, to hear how the Lord's using us as a church around the world. Hey, I want us to be able to see, do, see us to do more, amen, uh, by God's grace. Hey, if God lays something on your heart, then you know what? He's going to enable you to do that. Mm. Faithful is he who cometh you who also will do it. Uh, he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. We can do all things through Christ, which strengthens us. Amen. Uh, Paul said over and over through Philippians. Here, these believers in Antioch, they recognized that. They did it. They did it. Let's not just be hearers of the word, but doers also, mm-hmm. as James says. Amen. There, uh, <clears throat> Dylan read James 4 even this morning. We need to be doers of the word. Amen. The last thing we see then is the end of verse 30. They sent it by the elders, to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. This gift was delivered by Barnabas and Saul. And once again, the gift was delivered and, and it was carried out. Amen. We just need to be faithful. What is it that God has given you to do? What is it that maybe even you've recognized what it is God wants you to do and maybe you've even purposed in your heart to do it. But there's a little bit of hesitation because you're not sure. God, I'm just not sure we can do that. Just not sure we can afford that. Just not sure that's that's really where you want me to spend that much that much time. You want me to give that time to that ministry to be a blessing in that way? I'm just not sure that's exactly what. Or I just don't know if I can do that. Hey, faithful is he that called you. He will perform it. He will do it. Amen. Did these believers in Antioch, they didn't have much. They were going through a famine just like the rest of the world. And yet they purposed in their heart. As much as we're able. As much as God puts into our hands, we're going to pass it on and be a blessing to somebody else. Maybe God wants to use you to be that blessing. Mm. Amen. Let's just purpose in our hearts that we're going to demonstrate our faith. That we're going to be called Christians. Amen. Just like the Antioch Christians were. Because the world sees us demonstrate our faith. Just like the Christians at Antioch. Let's close and work.